Hello and welcome to knitting episode number 15 on this channel. My name is Helle and I'm coming to you from Denmark. And this episode has been uh, a long time in the making. I tend to have to um, get ready mentally, if you will, several days in advance. And it's a little ridiculous because, um, I mean, I'm just sitting here talking to the camera, but I kind of get a little bit of stage fright. <laughs> Probably because I know it's not just, uh, you know, at the end of the day, my phone looking at this. Um, so, well, there it is. If if you're a podcaster, uh, you may know what I mean. Um, so I'm, I'm going to try to pretend that I'm just talking to a friend here, which I guess I am. Just, you know, more than the one. But thank you so much for uh, tuning in, for showing up. I sound like a broken record, but I swear to God. The grayness will not leave Denmark. It's it's just it's ridiculous. So the light is is not fabulous. There's a hint of a flower I just saw, a crocus in my garden. But other than that, uh, at least now it no longer looks like a swamp. But it's just really gray. I hope that sometime in the future I will be able to uh, change the tune and talk about yay spring and things like that. So, But the weather is really neither here nor there. I guess it's just become sort of a habit of mine to begin uh, by talking about the weather. But I have a few things on the program. I have uh, three finished objects, one of which you've seen before but not on. And then I have two works in progress, one of which has undergone some serious sweater surgery uh, and it's partly still ongoing but it's nearing the end and um, just a few more plans that I have for some spring knitting and uh, one little acquisition and then I'll also be wrapping up the Nordic knit along that some of you have participated in so I'll do that at the very end but before I get into the knitting I'd like to start with a little quote and um, this week it's not really a very philosophical quote, although I guess it does talk about life. I mean, you know, it, it always does somehow, but it's an extract from a poem in a book that was given to me recently by uh, a young woman in uh, one of my yoga classes. And uh, she is a student and she had had a, um, you know, she'd had, she'd gone through a period of stress during her studies and she had to take some time out and her doctor had suggested that she try yoga and so she did and she came into a number of my classes over some months and then uh, a couple of weeks ago she came up and she gave me this uh, bag with I could see that there was candy and then there was a, a gift and she said to me several times you can exchange it you can exchange it but I just really want to show my gratitude and I, you know, I didn't want to unwrap it there in front of her, so I did when I came home, suspecting that was it was a book, and it was, and um, it was a collection of poems by a Danish poet called Tove Ditlusen, and it looks like this, and the title that bor en ung pige mig som ikke vil dø means there lives a young girl in me who will not die, or a young girl lives in me who will not die, and I just when I opened it I was like tearing up and uh, I told her the next time I saw her I can tell you that I'm not gonna exchange this I absolutely love it uh, and how did you know by the way that I like Tove Ditlusen and she was like mm, I don't know I just had a hunch because I do too and um, it's the first line of a poem in the book and all the poems are very sort of paradoxical or full of um, ambivalent sort of dualities and this sentence to me signals that you know we all still have that part of us that the younger versions of us and here it's even it's just written in a we, we all know that but here it's written in a sort of um, who will not die you know it's like she's trying to keep her alive which is sometimes fun and amazing but it's also sometimes a little problematic if she will not let go of certain dreams that you once had. So there's that sort of, mm, to me, paradox. But also, I guess, another way of uh, expressing a quote I've mentioned before, the whole we contain multitudes. 
So it's, I think it's part of our human predicament that we contain these different parts of ourselves. And I like the fact that somebody my age won't let the young girl in me die, which is kind of, I, I asked her, how did you, you know, apart from the whole two of Dietlers, and, and she, she said, well, I liked the cover. It was very sort of springy, the color. But I suspect there was also part of her that was drawn to, to the title. She was a young woman. I'm middle-aged. So there's just something, I don't know, ultimately life-affirming in this quote, I find at any rate. And I just, I just wanted to share that with you. Um, I don't know if that <laughs> means anything to you at all, but it just... I thought it was beautiful and at the same time there's a certain sense of melancholy in it and I'm always drawn to things that sort of balance those two, the life affirming versus the melancholy or and the melancholy, if that makes any sense. Um, if you haven't already checked out Tuva Dietlison, maybe give her a shot. She's also written some really heart-wrenching and humorous and um, lovely novels. Definitely somebody worth checking out as a Danish writer. And that's that on the quote front. <laughs> okay, so the first finished object is, of course, the Gatta sweater. I say, of course, it's what I'm wearing. Um, and you saw it sort of bunched up last time because the pattern hadn't quite come out. It's now come out and there's also a skirt that uh, looked really good on some of the other testers. I thought, mm, probably not for me. But um, I really love the sweater. Right now, I've just chosen the sort of slouchy version. You can also make it into a regular turtleneck. I say regular. It's not really regular. It's a slouchy, generous turtleneck, which I really like. Um, but I also like the sort of um, casual, just sort of thrown on way that it, when it's sort of like this. And sometimes I wear a little scarf underneath. I just find that it sometimes makes me feel... Uh, makes me feel a little hotter so I chose not to right now since I'm already on camera. I talked about most of the details last time but in case you haven't seen that video which is perfectly fine um, I'm just gonna recapitulate it briefly. This was the yarn combo that I opted for so it's Isa Merilin or Marilyn which is 80% uh, wool 20% flax and their silk mohair in the color 62 and 61 um, which gives it this sort of um, mm, yeah I don't know it's not it's not a cool rose but it's not exactly completely warm either if it was I would look awful <laughs> I don't know maybe I do but it's um it I think the color lands somewhere in between these two um, this might have been my preferred color which is a little more classically rose but I kind of like the fact that this makes it slightly less mm, romantic maybe um, and creates that sort of um, slightly variegated look you know you can't quite decide it has like an amber tint to the rose color I like that I like it when colors aren't sort of easy to place I love the drape. It's uh, it's also not too warm because it's just one strand of each. The original pattern has two strands of spinny from Isa instead of the Maryland. So it's a little, I imagine, a little thicker. And I partly chose the Maryland because it was lighter, i.e. not as warm, but also potentially slightly less scratchy. And this feels pretty good. I do t sometimes have to wear a scarf underneath, but it's not too bad, actually. Um, and I love the wide sleeves. I love the wide boxy fit and I love the generous collar. It's a perfect garment in my mind. It's exactly the kind of fit that I really enjoy. It's um, relaxed, uh, but pretty cool, I find. And um, you know, you could be comfortable while looking um, classy, <laughs> I think. I was maybe a little challenged up here in the beginning when you have to sort of uh, create all these different sections. Um, like the front and the raglan, the sleeve and raglan back, etc. So you really have to sort of be careful in the beginning. But after that, it's really uh, intuitive and you can read your knitting. Uh, and at the same time, something happens. You know, you've got the 
the cables they turn the same way every time so you don't have to sort of put the needle in the back then in the front in the back and front and these you just have to be mindful of the squares where to where to switch from pearls to knits um, but it it uh, it's actually it was enjoyable and at the same time engaging I knitted it on a 4.5 millimeter needle uh, US 7 and I think the pattern calls for four so you know I swatched and I've often gone up um, a needle size from Aegonis at least when Caroline has knitted them I think her mom and I have the same tension Oh, and I should also mention that it's part of ESA Archives collection that came out in February and March. A number of Danish designers contributed to the ESA Archives, where they all sort of um, paid tribute to uh, earlier designers by, uh, or one earlier designer maybe, Åse Lund Jensen, I forget. By taking their inspiration in, in a previous pattern, they updated it and altered it and made it sort of contemporary. So it's a um, tribute to past patterns, but also sort of a reinvention of them using Isa yarns, of course. It comes in eight sizes from a uh, chest circumference of 106 centimeters to 160, which is about, the largest is about 63, 64 or something like that inches. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty size inclusive, I find. Yeah, you can see a lot of different colors uh, on Instagram or possibly on Ravelry. I'm not sure how many are up there now. And of course, if you don't want the generous sleeves, you can always cinch it in and make decreases or more decreases. But I like this relaxed boxy fit. I really enjoy it like that. I'm, I'm all for um, relaxed sleeves. There was an Italian cast on and I also use an Italian bind off. And I quite enjoy those because they make it look really neat. And there's also something meditative to me about doing the Italian bind off. Having said that, um, when you then get to do the regular one, it's kind of a, ah, for once it's it's easier and less time consuming. But I do enjoy the, the very sort of the nice finish here. For instance, you can see it here. It's got a neat finish. That was the Gata sweater. I will move on to the next um, finished object. And I think I'm just gonna change for that. Okay, so I just changed to my next finished object, which is of course the Euros slipover. And I will of course also show you clips of me wearing it. And I'm super happy with the result. It's very cozy, I find, but also kind of uh, androgynous, which I think is interesting. So it's, um, you've got the, the sort of classical Aran cables, but then you got the little toggles and you got the fact that it's open and airy, and then you can just style it like, you know, well, like a slipover. And I, I think that's, it's because that's relatively new for me to style a slipover like that. Uh, maybe that's also why I find it androgynous, but I think that's interesting. The yarn that I used, is uh, not the recommended yarn or the yarn used in the pattern. Um, in the pattern, the yarn Hanwerksgarn from Jelholt Ulspinneri is used, and that's an absolutely gorgeous yarn, but it's also quite rustic. Um, some of the other testers used Woolia from Gepardgarn, or Gepard yarn, <laughs> and uh, I didn't really gravitate to any of those colors for this particular project because I'd already seen um, the Hunrex gun being used in the original versions and I wanted something that emulated that and I found another yarn from Gepard Gun or Gepard Yarn which is the Pure Alana in this particular light gray color paired with their cashmere lace and I'm really happy with um, this color it's like a it sort of resembles the weather here like a Nordic beach on a gray early spring day or something like that and to me it, it suited the pattern um let's see what can i say about it i again went up half a needle size or when i say half a needle size it's half a millimeter so i think the um, ribbing i've knitted on 4.5 millimeter us 7 and the rest 5.5 us 9 and um 
I did that after having done a swatch, of course. I don't just automatically do it because every now and then I do hit gauge for, for somebody's pattern. I had actually tried on uh, Kaolina's white or off-white version, cream version first, where she has a turtleneck. And I could tell that um, it was a little, for me, a little wide. And that's cool. Uh, I just felt that I would maybe uh, look a little too boxy in it. So one thing I did in terms of modifications, you knit, you knit it from the side, which you can, of course, tell here. So you start, I think, at the back. And then you knit this part at the back. And then once you get to where you have to do, uh, well, you, you increase gradually. And then at some point you cast on a number of stitches for the whole sort of shoulder. And then you continue on the front uh, on the same side. And then you knit this way so that this sort of, you know, is knitted this way on the whole piece. And then at some point you stop so that you can begin to decrease for the neckband or the neckline. And I stopped just a tiny bit sooner, which got me into all sorts of trouble. Uh, because then I had to find out over here, when do I then uh, pick up again over here or increase over here. But the reason why was I wanted to make it just a tiny bit narrower because I was afraid it was going to be too wide around here. Um, and it came out pretty, pretty nice, I think. I quite, I'm quite happy with this. Um, but also, it was also because it was a little more minimalistic, the pattern. At that stage, I was one of the testers. And I did make a lot of comments. And I imagine some of the others also did. And I know the pattern, which is out now, has become much more detailed. Virtually every line is written out. And there are diagrams for everything. And there's a little sort of which there's a photo of uh, the finished vest lying sort of down, opened, where you can see which section is knitted first and which comes after, etc. So it should be, you know, more handheld than initially. Um, you should still have some knitting experience because otherwise you're going to be emailing her, asking her, how do I do this and how do I do that? So you need to, you need to have tried garments and German short rows and... Um, I'm not sure that, yeah, maybe the cables too, but um, I don't know. To me, that's the that's the most intuitive part because once you you begin to do the cables, you can pretty much read your knitting. It's the construction that I find tricky. It usually is, but I think you you'll be okay with the pattern. One thing I did is um, she has the the second button, the second toggle, sort of up here. I decided to put it a little further down because I knew that would, I tr when I tried hers on, I tried putting it a little further down and it cinched the vest in just a tiny bit uh, instead of just sort of doing the whole tent thing. And I quite like that, which means you just need to alter that when you, when you make the ribbing. Something else that helped me out was um, the ribbing is, you pick up stitches for the ribbing after having knitted the vest. Um, the first part of the ribbing, this part right here, you, you begin with that. This is after, and this is after, and this is after. There were quite a few stitches that you have to pick up along the armhole here. And I was worried that I wouldn't get the same number of stitches on the other side. So what I did was I would, for instance, uh, pick up 20 stitches, then put a light bulb stitch marker. And then by the time I got to the other side, I would make sure that I had you know, for instance, 20 stitches, light bulb stitch marker, and then again, and then I would make sure to um, repeat that, to imitate that on the other side so that it would look pretty similar. Um, I, I, I think I often do that if it's something like that. And this is the folded down neckline. It also comes with an option of, well, you could do that even if it didn't come with that option, but uh, Kalina has a version where it's a mock turtleneck and that looked really cool. I really liked the look of that, but I didn't I didn't make that for several reasons. One reason being that I had just knitted the Gata sweater where there was a turtleneck. So I thought, well, you know, let's have some variation. Another was that um, this is just a tiny bit scratchy. <laughs> it wouldn't it it wouldn't be on so-called normal people but i do i have knitted the upper sweater by egg unit in this yarn combination as well where i do tend to have a little scarf under usually there's a mock turtleneck it doesn't quite sit close on my neck but here even you know if i don't 
wear the shirt under, I might be able to feel it. And I do like the look of the shirt under, so I, I quite like that. And that was the third reason. I wanted to be able to style it like this sort of, you know, yeah, like a some somewhere between a collegiate and a grandfather vest, if that makes sense, which would inevitably mean having a shirt underneath. Um, so, yeah. And, and also, um, since there are no sleeves on this, it's it's really lovely to wear because I don't get overheated. So it's a really good uh, transitional piece for me. And if I had put um, a, a mock turtleneck on, for me, that would in a way defeat the purpose of having a, a transitional piece because I get really hot if I have a turtleneck that's very much up to here. Um, ideally, I would have liked to be able to, I thought about that for a second, uh, of not actually sewing it down. I knitted it onto here. I knitted it together with, I think, partially Jenny's surprisingly stretchy bind off in order not to get it too tight. And um, ideally, I might have actually just somehow tacked it down so I could alternate and both have a mock turtleneck and a, a folded down collar. But I decided in the end, let's just let's just go with this because then I don't have to make decisions all the time and it will it will look look neat. So all in all, uh, I'm really pleased with it. It was challenging, but I think that was because the pattern was, it was in the testing process, but probably also because it was sort of knitting from the side. I just could not wrap my head around the order in which things came. So I was constantly sort of going, you know, this is like a piece of engineering. I, you know, what goes first? But I think you are told that uh, in, the, in the finished pattern. So it should be okay. And also it's a um, twisted rib, which you can see. Let me show you more close up here. Uh, twisted rib and Italian bind off. I only did the twisted uh, stitches on the front. So you can see this looks more regular because you don't actually see it. No need to create twisted pearls on the right side and damage your wrists when you can't actually see it. That's, I found out that a, a while back that you only do the twisted uh, stitches on both the right and the wrong side when it's like a turtleneck when you can see both the inside and the outside and here you can't. So um, the knit stitches are twisted on the right side and then the purl stitches are twisted on the wrong side. And it creates a really nice um, sort of clean look I find. And I think it goes well with the, with the cables that are sort of um, classic. So all in all, I really, really enjoy this and I've worn it several times. And it's a bit of a surprise to me that I enjoy a, a, a vest this much or slipover. It's a really good garment for people who tend to overheat a little. <laughs> I should also mention that the yarn that I used highly influenced uh, the drape of the fabric. Purilana is 50% wool, 50% alpaca and it drapes quite a lot. Uh, some of the other testers used woolia, and woolia creates quite a bit of a denser fabric. Woolia with um, kitsita silk mohair, but still um, somewhat denser, maybe tighter fabric. And the Hunvax gun is probably somewhere in the middle, a single strand. So consider how you want your garment if you want to make the year slip over. Drapey or a little bit sort of tighter, denser, thicker maybe. So my next finished object, finished project, is the javelin shawl that I am just so happy with. And um, it was also a joy to knit. I will, of course, put clips of me wearing it. The light changes completely when I... This is what it looks like up close. I think I'm just going to throw in a clip of me wearing it in natural daylight without the camera freaking out about me changing the light. But it's a shawl pattern by Titi Lutzak or Titi's Knit Garden. It's a crescent shaped shawl. It's about a uh, half meter wide and two meters long. And it's 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 unusual for me to, to knit something like this because it's I don't see a whole lot of shawls in Denmark. And I'm still sort of uh, experimenting with how I should wear it. 
um, but I love it so much. Maybe sort of, hmm. I think I'll try to do it outside. So I think I'm gonna put it down because the camera goes nuts. One of the things that I really like about this is that when I look at it, the pattern, I mean the texture that is created here, it reminds me like of, um, of a Gothic cathedral or something. Do you, do you understand what I mean? It's like those, those windows where they have the glass mosaic or the arches over the doors. That's what it reminds me of. And I think it fits nicely with the color. That's also a little sort of gloomy, moody, medieval almost. So I really, I really, really like this. And I, I think I partly love the shape and I really enjoyed the knitting. And as mentioned last time, I also really um, love the yarn. It's La bien -Aimée. Uh, Merino DK in the colorway Winterfell and it's a really moody tealy black blue color that I think is just um, absolutely wonderful and as I mentioned I partly fell for its moodiness and partly for the fact that it's called Winterfell from Game of Thrones and um, this is called Javelin because Javelin is a kind of spear, light spear. And javelin is also when you have track and field contests in, for instance, Olympics, when they throw that spear, that's a javelin. So the idea is that this is um, kind of body armor. I really like that. And uh, Teddy Lutsak is Ukrainian, so that makes perfect sense. Um, oh my gosh, I love it so much. I've been a little uh, hesitant about wearing it, partly because I'm a a bit in doubt as to how to style it but I think it's going to be better here in spring because it might look better over some of my lighter outerwear I'm not sure but also sort of it's new for me to to um, to wear shawls so I'm still sort of figuring out how to wear it but I like wearing it inside instead of a cardigan and it's also um, like cardigans or like a slipover it's just it's just easier to wear because you can easily take it off when you overheat instead of having to pull a sweater off and overheating if it's an issue which it is for me this is really it's both beautiful and practical i think i mentioned a, f a couple of things last time about it but i'll just repeat some of it here it's knitted on a five millimeter needle for no it's knitted on a 4.5 i went up half a millimeter and um, I'm glad I did because I had to sort of stretch it in the blocking phase to get the required length. Um, one thing I will mention when I washed it or soaked it before blocking, I put in quite a bit of uh, plain vinegar, i.e. not colored vinegar, to ensure that the yarn wouldn't lose too much of its color. I really didn't want it to get much lighter. I knew that was a kind of... Uh, something to you can do to preserve colors or to if you have two different colors one lighter one darker you could put vinegar in the water to ensure that the darker color doesn't bleed especially if it's a reddish color and it's worked before when I made the um, um, pink velvet by Andrea Mary I had sort of pink color work uh, up in the yoke on a sort of dove gray blue light dove gray blue background color and I was so afraid that it would uh, bleed over into that and it didn't and I think maybe it wouldn't have other, uh, at any rate but I did put quite a bit of vinegar in the water and and I did too here and there was a tiny bit of a tint in the water when I drained it but not much and I think the color is pretty much the same as as when I knitted it. It came at the price of a slight vinegary scent <laughs> which I realized once I began to wrap myself in it. Um, but that's fine. The color came out as I want it. So I'm just going to air it a little on my clothesline outside. The slight fold or crease there in the middle is from having been folded. Um, and that's another thing I have to now consider. How do I fold it over? How do I store it um, in order not to have that crease in the middle there? Hmm. On a hanger, maybe? How do you store your shawls to avoid that? I do.
I really like this um, shape, the crescent shape. It's very generous. You can wrap yourself in it. And I definitely feel drawn to other um, generous shawls so that you can get that whole cozy feeling. And I also like that it's not too long so that you know you can wear it goes to about my elbow so you can actually wrap it around yourself I guess if it was longer you could just bunch it up but um, yeah I'm really really happy with this the pattern was easy to follow there's a lot in the beginning I had no clue what I was doing because I didn't quite get it and I hadn't knitted a shawl before so I was just trusting the pattern which you can do all the way through and she writes for every row how many stitches are on the needles. So it's it's pretty uh, foolproof. Somebody wrote to me that they tried it and always ended up with a stitch too much or was it a stitch too little? And I find that that's probably, for me, a couple of times I had a stitch too little. And that was when I had forgotten to do a yarn over in the very beginning. At other times you do, if you are mindful of what the sort of repetition uh, is on that particular row you can go back and and check check it out one thing i will say which goes for um one of my works in progress also is that since i was sort of halfway through with this when i began knitting the euro slip over when i then fi i finished the euro slip over since it was a test i you know there wasn't a deadline but i still wanted to you know finish it um, then when I returned to this, I was like, oh, how did I do that one stitch again where you uh, increase in the middle of a small cable? And I thought I remembered and then I knitted a few rows. And then I looked at it going, mm, that doesn't look right. Then I went back and saw her video. And it dawned on me that she's got a video for how to do that. It dawned on me that I wasn't doing it correctly because I'd forgotten. For the first many rows, it, it became automatic. But then when I was away from it for a few weeks, I, I kind of forgot since it was a new thing for me. Um, so um, note to self, if it's something that's a little tricky, don't stray from it for too long because you might forget whatever technique or something that you needed to keep in mind. Um, so while I do like to have more than one project on my needles, there was one point where I had four and that's too many for me. Uh, and then if I'd had only two, I might have not um, encountered that problem. The problem was then I had to unravel. And at that point I had about 400 stitches on my needle. And some of them were tricky to put back on the needles. I couldn't quite see how they turned. So I was, there were a couple of days where I felt really frustrated with myself. But, you know, there you are. <laughs> my God, it's grey. Ugh. This, you know... This isn't even overcast, it's over overcast. Danish overcast, maybe. At one point I counted the number of minutes it took me to knit one row and I think it took me about half an hour. That was when I was up to 500 stitches. And that's not actually bad, five, uh, half an hour, because it was pretty automatic. There were just many stitches. Um, but that's only, you know, well, the last few rounds or rows. But I didn't mind that because it was intuitive. Every round you could just, you know, every round it would it would switch. But they 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 were similar, and it was just I don't know. There was something repetitive, yet engaging and meditative about it. And oh, I cannot oh, this color. Oh my god. There are many of you who said that you really like this color as well, and I have to say, oh my gosh. The tonal variety of this and the name Winterfell, I mean, hello, it has my name all over it. And then in this, um, with this pattern, uh, I think I may have mentioned, but the cast on was um, an I-cord edge, I-cord cast on. I hadn't tried that before and she doesn't explain it. She just said cast on with an I-cord. I'm like, oh, okay. And you know, every time you see something like that, somebody wrote something to me recently. How did you blah, blah, blah? I'm like, mm, your first instinct should always be to go on YouTube, find a tutorial. There's a tutorial on everything these days, usually several. So, uh, you know, Google really is your friend or YouTube in that connection. So, so um, instead of asking me <laughs> or the designer, you know, what you also get from that is you learn. 
you know and that's I've googled and gone on YouTube for practically every project if there's something that I hadn't heard of before or if there's a phrase something I was in doubt of and it just you know you upgrade your knitting game every time and it, you to me that's empowering um, and sometimes my initial reaction is to go oh no I'm not good enough and then right after that I will find out okay so you the risk is that sometimes when you throw yourselves into patterns where you're a little out of your depth you may feel inadequate but that's okay that's how we grow we cannot grow inside our comfort zone it's just not possible which means that um, you will have to do some research find out how to do it look on YouTube and sometimes it takes it takes some diligence and patience but you're already in the game of knitting so it kind of comes with the territory I find and I'm so grateful every time when I master something that I'm like huh got that down now ready to move on um, so I find it very um, fulfilling to have knitted a shawl definitely not my last moving on to one of my works in progress and I just want to preamble this by saying this is the last time you're going to see both of these whips until they're done. One of them is going to be done by next time. The other is emphatically not. I do feel a little sort of, you know, when certain works in progress crop up in every episode or something, it's like, when is she going to be done? But I've had too many projects uh, on the go uh, at one time. So I think that's that's why. But this is the the lavender project the agio sweater which has been a real enjoyment but also mm, i'm not sure if you can say this in english but in danish we have this phrase where you, two steps forward one step back and that's kind of what this project has been so the last time i showed you this the body was too wide and the sleeve was too wide the one sleeve that i'd begun and i was sort of you know what should I do? It was a bit of a conundrum to me. I had some ideas, but I was in doubt because it would require quite a bit of uh, surgery. And that's ultimately also what I, I did. It was nice for me to finish this one and to finish the javelin shawl because then it could sort of lay on the back burner a little. Um, and then the whole idea of actually cutting into it seemed a little less daunting by the time I finally got to it because it had not improved you know it hadn't gotten smaller just by lying in the basket which meant I was like right do I want this sweater or do I not a couple of people suggested that I keep it as a vest um, since I'd shown it just uh, without the sleeve or without or with just one sleeve I definitely wanted the sweater I could see how that could work um, you'd need to make it for me even narrower prop probably but I could see how that would work but I would need to do something to create a better finish around the edge here for me anyway I'd already decided on the sweater um, but uh, I like the idea for you know some other time anyway what I did was I laid it down and then I put my bobby sweater on top partly because I really like the fit of the bobby it's also really wide but it's oversized in a way that well, it drapes nicely, I find, on my body and I like wearing it. I really like the fit of it. And also they're both knitted in the same yarn in Puno by Gepard Gan. And this, yeah, this is the lovely lavender color. And so I found that was a sort of fair comparison. They were almost the same width, but this one being a half fisherman's rib is a little more bulky. So it didn't sort of lay flat as much, but would sort of more bulk outwards instead of draping down. So the first thing I did was I ripped out the sleeve because I knew it was going to be too wide. Then I soaked it and blocked it. I, I didn't put any pins in. I just wanted to see how much would it drape and how wide would it then be. It was still a little too wide, but more importantly, too long. So it had just sort of... You know, it's like the water had really dragged it down. Then I measured it again and I tried, uh, I measured the width again and next to the bawi. And I could see that I, I couldn't really use that as a way of measuring it because um, because the different stitch pattern made the, the fabric drape differently. So I tried to um, sort of just <laughs> using my hands, um, pinching in the fabric seeing where does where do I want the seam because I was gonna 
I was going to have to have a seam. And then I put in some needles or some pins on the, on the inside to pretend that they were now seams until I had the desired width. Then I pulled down my ancient sewing machine from our attic. I mean, I haven't, I don't think I've looked at it in at least 10 years. The first thing I did was when the needles were in, I took a strand of really, um, this, this Japanese cotton that is used for bags sometimes because it's quite wide and it's papery looking and it's white. I then threaded it through the, the line of stitches where I'd put the pins so that I would be able to see afterwards where to sew after I'd taken the pins out. When I say where to sew, where to put the mat mattress stitches. So I made two lines of the zigzag, which was, I guess, a kind of sticking. And then I used mattress stitches to, to, um, to knit the seam together. And this is pretty much what it looks like. I think it looks pretty okay. It's not all that apparent to see what the seam is. And then it looks like this instead here. So I had to fudge a little here because as you can see over on this side, a little still, the back having no cables is a little wider because the cables tend to cinch in the, the width of the fabric a little. So I did take it in slightly more on the back than on the front, but looks pretty nice I think. Um, I'll insert some, if I haven't already done it, some pictures of um, what it looks like, what it looked like during the process. So of course it's not super pretty on the inside right now. Right now it looks like this, but it works. I might try to learn how to do a crocheted edge just to make it look a little nicer on the inside. Many years ago after I attended high school here in Denmark I went on a brief or a brief like a five month stay at this place called Skets Honabites High School, which is like a it's a long course that you do with this kind of school and it was all about uh, crafting and different things sewing and crocheting and uh, embroidering and things like that and clay making clay I actually remember making a porcelain doll of all things a Victorian little porcelain doll and I made the clothing for her and one of the things that they taught us was that the inside had to look as nice as the outside. Hmm. I wasn't very good at doing that at the time. And I can still, see I'm still challenged in that department. But I do know what they mean. You want this to look a little neater than this. So, you know, let's see if I end up doing that. Right now I'm pretty happy with how it looks on the outside. Also, because it had grown substantially, at least six or seven centimeters, which is like, I don't know almost two inches, um, it got a little longer. So I unraveled it again. Then I went back and started over, um, took away sort of all the way up until I had six centimeters less and then did the ribbing from there. I did have to do just a couple of rows of uh, German short rows and that's where I ran into more problems. So I have to unravel again because you can see here that you can tell my stitches are a little different and that's because it's now knitted flat. So my uh, fisherman's rib stitches look different when I knit flat as, to, as compared to when I knit in the round. I think they become a little looser when I knit flat. So I have to go back, unravel again and then do this and then do the same as when I knitted the Weekender by Andre Maury. I think I rem remember mentioning that in that video. Uh, where I had mm, the long cable needle and then I had one size needle on one side, one size on the other. So I did the larger number on the right side, the smaller number on the wrong side so that I could um, get a little closer to what the stitches looked like when I knitted in the round. I thought it was going to come out in the blocking so I tried blocking it, the bottom part here, but it didn't. And then I remembered that, oh yeah, I knit more loosely. I knit the pearl stitches probably a little more loosely when it comes to fisherman's rib and um, German short rows. Another problem is that I think um, I did the ribbing in the recommended needle size. And to me, it cinches in too much. I want it a little more open. Um, this is knit, knitted on a six millimeter and this I knit it on a four millimeter as per the pattern. I think I'm going to unravel and knit it on a five so that it's actually quite sort of 
loose. That's what the Bawi looks like and I prefer that. Something else. When I then uh, picked up for the sleeve, um, I'd already picked up 10 stitches fewer than what the pattern calls for, but that still looked too big for me. So I picked up nine stitches fewer again. And I think I like the, I like the size now. It looks a little weird here when it's all bubbly and bulky here, but I, I've tried it on and it does look nice because it is an oversized sweater. You don't want, I don't want fitted sleeves, but what I did was I used the yarn that I'd used before. And this very fluffy yarn, I don't have the ball of yarn now with me, but after I'd knitted almost this much, I could tell that the fabric looked different from this fabric. It was like the yarn had become thinner and tighter from having been knitted with once. And I was unsure if that would come out in the blocking. So I unraveled again, discarded that ball of yarn and began again using this I do have enough, I think, because I have uh, yarn for um, size two and I've done so much sweater surgery now that I'm almost back up to a size one, except for the, the drop shoulder here. So you can see that it's, there's, it's as if there's a wedge here and that's kind of what I wanted. So the top part here is a size two and then the sweater surgery means it's more or less a size one. If you were to knit this today and you wanted the same fit, the less super oversized look without <laughs> doing the sweater surgery, that's actually possible. I'm showing you this in case you have a sweater at home um, and you've, you've always found it too big or you know you needed to, to do something to it or it became too large in the blocking and you didn't feel like unraveling, then you could do something like this. If you, however, were to knit this today, there might be a sweater update that uh, takes this into account. But since this is purely me wanting it not so oversized, if you feel the same, what you can do is when this, when, if you want the same drop shoulder effect that it goes a little further down than the size one up here, then what you can do is here, you can simply not only not do the increases, you can make decreases. And I think the number of stitches that I've cut out, I counted, of course, to make sure that I did the same under each arm. It was exactly the number of stitches as if I had not made decreases, not made increases, but actually decreases instead. I think eight stitches is what I seem to recall. So it would give you the same effect. That way you would get the sort of the drop shoulder effect, but not that much fabric around your chest. So let's see. <laughs> oh my gosh, the ongoing saga, but I still love it. I still love uh, knitting it and it's a joy. And I'm, I do actually uh, channel quite a bit of patience and because that's all I can do. If not, I'm not gonna get a finished object, so the last work in progress that I have. This is probably the last time in months you're going to be able to see it or you're going to see it here because I suspect that um, in a little while I'm going to cast this aside until the autumn. But it's the Aurelia pullover. I've just decided to knit the neckline so I could try it on. The Aurelia pullover by Sari Nordland. And I think it's going to be a really lovely, probably Christmas sweater. Apropos rounds or rows that take a long time, holy moly. This is next level cables, I have to say. It takes such a long time, but I feel like if I finish this, I'm going to feel pretty proud of myself. <laughs> I will finish it, but it's uh, it just takes a really long time. I'm knitting the third size and I've actually made the number of increases for sleeves and body that are supposed to be the right number for the third size. And I can see that's just not enough. If I stick with that, it's gonna be quite a fitted sweater. And I think she does intend it to be a fitted sweater, at least it looks relatively fitted on her in the photo. And I don't want it that fitted. I want a little more of a relaxed fit. So I think I'm gonna do a couple of more uh, increase rounds, go with maybe the next size up or even the next size up and 
um, figure it out. But that's why I began knitting the neckline or the neckband so that I can try it on for size and see. Uh, so when I get around to doing that, finishing that, and uh, increasing a couple of more rounds, I'm going to try it on and then see if, if that works. And then I think from then on it's just knitting without increasing. I can just follow the charts. And I think once I've reached that point, I might put it aside because it's definitely an autumn project um, because I have some other things lined up. So, so that might be a plan, but I'm still really happy with it. Uh, it's just, it takes patience uh, and it's easy to make a mistake, but you have, as long as you're vigilant and not, you know, if you have your mind elsewhere, it might be a little tricky, but it makes sense. And the pattern is pretty clear. So there's nothing, you know, untoward in that sense. And as mentioned, I'm knitting it in uh, La Bien Me. Uh, the, again, the Merino DK, same base as the Winterfell. This is um, Amy's Flashy Lipstick, which is a mix of uh, pink and red. Yeah, it looks a little fluorescent uh, in this camera. It's, it's not, actually. I don't know if you can tell. Yeah, you might be able to see that there's pink in there. I have no idea. But one of, one of those tonal, slightly variegated yarns again that I really like. So I've had my share of cables, as you can see, and I suspect um, once I uh, finish the Aegeo sweater, this is going to wait. I'm going to be, uh, you know, finished with cables for a while. Then I wanted to share some yarn that I got from a friend in the United States, uh, a very generous gift. And I wanted to share it with you, partly because I'm sort of wondering what should I make with it. If somebody has an idea, I'm definitely open. But it's five skeins of, I, I always think it's when you're over here and Isaiah and Gepard Gan and uh, Sentis Gan and other, other yarn companies, the Nordic yarn companies are everywhere. It's always so exotic and interesting to see new yarns. So um, I was given this um, stunning color. I cannot get over this color. It's like a mix between slate gray and cool brown. It's just Maybe there's a color name for this in English. I don't know. It's called dark gray and it's Limani Santi. And there's this amazing Yakox uh, on the cover here or on the label. And it's 45% um, ultra fine merino, 25% baby alpaca, 15% yak and 15% mulberry silk. <gasps> it's just luscious. I, you know, I'm so grateful. So thank you, my friend. <laughs> who shall remain nameless according to her own wishes. And that's absolutely fine. But I'm just completely in love with the softness of this, with the color of this. And um, what I've tried is that uh, she suggested maybe I wanted to use it for a shawl or some kind of accessory. So I immediately jumped on Ravelry, uh, put in shawl and then you can filter. It's really cool. Uh, I expect most of you know this, but you can you can sort of um, you can filter for uh, DK weight, which this is. I think it's a very thin DK weight, so I think I also filtered for sport. And then you could add the yardage, how much yarn you have, and I think I have about 625 meters. And what what are the possible projects? So I did find a couple of uh, shawl options that I'm looking into. Um, but then I also uh, saw this kind of slip over from wool folk yarn and um, it looks a lot like a slip over I already have that I bought from the gap like 12 years ago and it's I've used it to the point of sort of exhaustion um, and I I really would like something like that the problem is it's knitted in bulky weight yarn so um, that would mean I have to do some math and I'm like Ugh, my head is spinning a little with at the idea of that which meant I went back to the idea of a shawl um, but I'm not sure if I gravitate super much to any of the ones that uh, came out as a result so I'm still sort of on the fence about what to do with this yarn but I just I really love it um, I think isn't that also kind of a moody color I think um, but also a little earthy and it's it's one of those colors again you can't quite decide if it's brown or gray and I really like it when you can't just 
decide when you can't place it. So I'm super grateful for that and cannot wait to uh, knit something with it. All the, the yarns that I've been given, I'm, you know, I really, I really want to knit with them, but I've, I feel like I'm such a slow knitter. And then when I take on a test knit, oof, it's like, I just can't knit fast enough. But I do sometimes lie sleepless going, then I want to knit that from that person and that from that person. So I'm still thinking so much about the yarns that I've been given and I treasure them and I really want to, I really want to do them justice and knit the projects. Um, but you know, I'm in this knitting game for the long haul, so it's going to happen. Just maybe not quite yet. One day at a time, one project at a time. And one of the next things that is going to be on my needles is going to be uh, a test knit for Agonet once again. And I talked to her a while back suggesting, you know, how about a cardigan? <laughs> I am always in need of uh, cardigans. Well, I find myself using cardigan, using transitional knits, using knitwear that I can easily take off. And that gives me a little bit of, if I've been, as I mentioned last time, when I've been uh, wearing cardigans, that was the cardi cocoon. The fact that it's open means that I just get, you know, there's more of a breeze uh, around my heated up body. <laughs> it's just really nice. So an, another cardigan would just be right up my alley. And I really like the popo jacket that's uh, that she's going to come out with. I tried it on at her house and it was just really cozy. It was warm. Um, so I think I'm going to be knitting it in a slightly different yarn combination. But in a, did we decide on a muted light gray color or something? Sage plus gray? I forget. But I think it was the same yarn combination that I used for my Sion kimono, which is like a light cardigan kind of outerwear thing that isn't too hot during the summer. So I'm really looking forward to that. I haven't gotten the yarn yet, but I will hopefully um, next week. Maybe by the time you see this, I will have started or I will have gotten it. But I've decided that I want to be finished with the Aegyo sweater first so that I don't have too many projects at one point time it just makes it easier in my mind I used to be a monogamous knitter and I quite enjoy not being a monogamous knitter having several uh, things on the go but if they're too complex or one is a test knit it can become a little stressful so I don't want to four at a time is maybe a little much for me Let, let's see it did it worked but I just tended to forget some things um, if if two of them are quite simple it might work so uh, let's see and then I did a little sort of organizing of my yarn the other day and decided, okay, I'm going to be knitting this next and that next and then that. So let's see if that's going to, that if that's going to actually happen. But I have some definite plans. And uh, one of them is also a sweater that another podcaster mentioned a while back that has actually been in my queue for about a year. And it's the crystal sweater by Helga Isaya which is just a gorgeous sweater. The, the sweater color that you see on the front wouldn't have attracted me, but then I saw another photo of it and that's the one that drew me to it. And I actually have it, I have the screensaver on my uh, computer where I have different sort of photos. It's like a kind of mood board for me. And this photo is actually one of them because there's that, she's outside, there's nature, there's the relaxed sort of look of her, but there's also something mm, breezy, ethereal, distant, maybe even melancholy, yet relaxed at peace. <laughs> so much into that, but I'm not, I, it looks absolutely beautiful in this off-white color, but I don't have yarn in that, which means I would have to buy it. So I'm trying to, uh, I have an idea of the yarn that I already have that I'm going to use for it. So let's see if that's going to happen. Maybe, maybe by the next video, maybe not, not making any promises. But there, there are some of my plans. So if you've watched this far and you have not taken part in the Nordic Knit Along and you are wanting to say goodbye, I thank you so much for being here, for listening to me ramble on. And I appreciate you um, when you like or when you watch or when you subscribe. I, you know, I don't necessarily need people to do more. I just appreciate what you already do. And I... I Thank you so much. 
I really appreciate you being here and I appreciate reading all your comments and um, feeling that I have this little community around me. It's really, it's really lovely. So on that note, um, let me wrap up the Nordic knit along that some of you have taken part in. And it was, I have to say, it was a little overwhelming for me at times, but also really fun to watch. It was very inspiring and um, fun to see what you're actually knitting. But trying to find the winners was tricky because I had to uh, check both comments on YouTube. I asked you to leave a comment regarding what you knitted during the knit along since I had launched it back in, when was that, August or July even? Um, and then compare those with uh, people who had, what you'd posted in the Ravelry group or on Instagram under the hashtag Nordic Knit Along. And that was tricky because sometimes people had different names, which I do myself, so I get it. I mean, that's not very smart of me, but I didn't think of that at the time. Presumably you haven't either. So I had to uh, do a little bit of sort of uh, fudging and researching, but um, I wish I could choose everybody, but unfortunately I couldn't. So I hope you just enjoyed being part of the knit along that there was a little bit of a community hand holding and sharing and feel free to keep on posting in the group if you feel like it. I will drop in every now and then. I can't promise a high degree of participation, but the group of course will stand. And I think that could be a nice way of um, sharing so I hope you got something out of that, even if you don't win anything. So I compared all this and just drew these four completely uh, or pulled these four completely random names that I could find both either on Instagram and in the comments or on Ravelry and in the comments, sometimes even all three. And if you have won one of these four prizes, I would like you to send me an email. I will put my email in the description box and then um, either I will ask for your address, if it's one of the yarns, or I will send it to uh, the person who generously uh, has donated a project bag. Could you please also maybe send me an email so that we can exchange addresses or you get the address for the person who won it. So I will put my email in the description box and you just, what you do is you write to me uh, if you're one of these four people. The first winner is, who won the a pattern by Aegonet of your choice is Marianne Cylon or Mayenne Cylon, I think. Mayenne Cylon 3136. So congratulations, Mayenne. And uh, the four plates of Plotolopi uh, in this color was won by Slow Knitter 1. So congratulations on that. I will send that to you if you send me your email, give me your address. And the project bag uh, donated by this generous uh, knitter from, generous viewer from New Zealand was won by uh, Gwendy Lady. So congratulations, Gwen. And the two balls of yarn, this, these two, was won by my namesake in Texas, Hille from Texas, who went to Tvestel. And her name, your name is a dot, I think, on Ravelry or YouTube. But I, I recognized your project and your name. So I will send that to you in Texas. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much for participating. Um, it may be a while until I organize a knit along again, partly because I couldn't figure out how to do this whole, you know, um, how to do the giveaway and in, in a fair and uh, systematic manner. But, so I hope this works. If you have any questions, by all means, drop me a line. Thank you for participating and sharing uh, everything you've made on either Instagram or uh, Ravelry and on YouTube. So I hope life is treating you okay and that maybe you're in touch with that girl inside you who will not die or that boy inside you who will not die. Because who knows, you know, sometimes we need to, uh, we need to channel other aspects of ourselves, I think, so that we don't get stuck, you know, our, our identities or whatever it is are fluid. We're not just whoever we are at the moment right now. We can be whatever we want. I hope that you feel that way too and that your knitting reflects it. Maybe we should do a little sort of out on a limb challenge, you know, just to try ourselves out, to venture outside our little comfort zone. 
Maybe you already have, or maybe you just need a little nudge. Let me know if that's you. I would love to know that. So that's pretty much that. I hope by the time you see me again, spring will have once and for all arrived in Denmark. I know I'm not alone in that hope. And I hope wherever you are that you're able to find small moments of joy and peace. So on that note, thank you so much for being here and take care.